We're getting started. Oh, it's time. It's time. Social hour's over. All right, good morning. If you would, uh, bow your heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, thank you for this morning that you've blessed us with. Thank you for bringing us here today to ultimately study your word and grow closer to you. Lord, as we finish the book of Daniel today, I thank you and I praise you for the wisdom that you've given me to provide this lesson. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that has guided me through interpreting all these verses and just preparing me to teach, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that this lesson is beneficial to everyone. And as we get ready to move back into the New Testament, I pray that you'll bless not only the teachings that I give, Lord, but the congregation. And I pray all this brings us closer to you. And I pray that it brings you glory. And I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. So, once again, oh, welcome back, Kelly. All right. So, once again, um, so we already covered chapter 10 and the first half of chapter 11. And basically, to catch you all up to speed is uh, chapter 9, you had the 490 year prophecy that basically um, predicted when the Messiah would come in the first 483 years, and then the, seven, the last seven years of the 490-year period is the tribulation period, okay? So then in chapter 10, we find Daniel, he's fasting, and he's mourning, and um, he, he's pretty upset, and he's praying, and that period lasts for like three weeks. And the reason why he's in that place mentally and just spiritually is because at that point in time, the Jews started to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and he didn't go with them, all right? So he's, he's like just praying for them, and he just feels bad about it. Well, because of that, God sent an angel to him um, to essentially comfort him, and also to provide him some prophecy. So that's what happened in like chapter 10, and also like the first half of chapter 11. And the whole prophecy up to this point was about the Ptolemaic Wars. It was about all the, the war and conflict that Jerusalem would be in the center of and how it would affect them. And then it kind of culminates with Antiochus Epiphanes, which comes onto the scene, you know, sub 200 BC. And the reason why that's important is because, as we covered in chapter 8, he serves as a form of like... Um, foreshadowing Antichrist in a lot of the ways. All right, so at verse 35, that's the end of the prophecy about Antiochus Epiphanes. So now what ends up happening is the law of double reference. So basically because of the similarities between Antiochus Epiphanes and what he does and what the Antichrist is and will do in the future, um, the prophecy just kind of changes gears. All right, and that's called the law of double reference in prophecy. And we talked about that before. Um, just understand that from verse 36 on, we're talking about the Antichrist, right? And then when we get into chapter 12, you'll see without a doubt that everything we just talked about is indeed the Antichrist and not Antiochus Epiphanes because of the context of what we're talking about in 12. Okay? So take us to the next slide. All right, so verse 36, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. All right, so once again, this king that we're talking about is the Antichrist, a future king that will, will be an actor as part of the tribulation period. All right, um, when he says here that he will say unheard of things against God, if we remember from chapter 7, the little horn, which was loud and boastful and like made all these claims about God, as well as what we read in the book of Revelation on how the Antichrist will carry himself. This is just mirroring that and echoing that. All right? And then at the end here it says, for what must be determined must take place. So once again, this whole event, the tribulation period, the seven-year period, it's already been foreseen by God. It's already part of God's plan. The devil doesn't know that. Um, the Antichrist for sure doesn't know that, but God knows it, 
all right? And it's now being revealed to Daniel through this prophecy. And it's already been revealed to him in prior prophecies as well, but it's just being further expanded upon. All right, take us to the next place. Next slide. All right, he will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above all. All right, so what this is saying here is that the Antichrist will not respect any previously established religious convictions. He is essentially going to have his own religious view, his own idolatry. And that idolatry that he has is himself and his power and his military might specifically. That is his false god. Okay? So it says gods of his ancestors. Remember, um, the Antichrist is going to come from the people that destroy the temple in 70 AD. All right? So the gods of his ancestors is saying that he's not a pagan believer. He's not believing in these gods of the Roman gods or the Greek gods or any other pagan religion, all right? The one desired by women, this one's one of those weird verses that could have a bunch of different meanings. Scholars are kind of all over the place on it. It could refer to um, one of the pagan gods that was a pagan god that was followed by women, whether it be for fertility or whatever, or it could just be more simply taken as the one desired by woman equals man. It could just be that. Like he has no regard for man um, because of the, like him waging war, the amount of death he's going to bring in, how he's going to execute and persecute man, etc. All right? And then we'll exalt himself above so that we know um, come the book of Revelation, you'll see it, as well as um, in prior texts, is like the Antichrist is going to demand worship for himself. And then when he sets up the abomination of desolation in the temple, he's going to demand that everyone pays worship to that. He's also going to demand that everyone takes on the mark of the beast. And if you don't, you're going to die, um, et cetera. All right, next slide. So instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. All right, so... Here, it's describing that idolatry that I was talking about. This god of fortresses that was unknown to his ancestors is this false idolatry of, like, himself. Like, he's worshiping himself, his power, his influence, his wealth, and specifically his military power, which is why it's called a god of fortress. Um, and then we'll see in the following text, as well as in the book of Revelation, like, the whole period, the whole seven-year period of tribulation is he's going to be leading a lot of different military conquests against other nations and specifically against the Jews. All right, next slide. All right, he will attack the mightiest fortress with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. All right, so here it's uh, being prophesied that he will reward kingdoms and people who follow him. But if you don't follow him or you don't support him in his conquest, okay. you're ultimately going to be his enemy, and you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be killed, etc. All right? And then the, the rhetorical question here at the bottom that I have emboldened here is, how does our knowledge of the world that we live in today affect our view of how this will look in the future? So we know, um, just based off of the prior teachings I've given and... and also our Bible studies about Revelation and what the tribulation period looks like is we know that in the period of tribulation, the seven-year period, the world will have this one whole world government that will be formed up of like a ten-nation confederation. And then from that, the Antichrist will emerge, right? And like how does our current view of the world give us insight into what that looks like? What will this ten-nation confederation be? And like we talked about it in our discussions before, maybe it's some kind of new version of the UN, maybe it's some kind of new version of like NATO that's like global wide, we don't know, right? But what we can see very clearly is that we're moving in that direction, right? Okay, next slide. All right, so at the time of the end, king of the south will engage him in a battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. Alright, so here we're talking about 
the beginning of these conflicts here. So you're going to have a king of the south and a king of the north. They're going to go to war. And the angels using um, these nouns such as chariots and cavalry, etc. Because once again, although this has taken place in the future, if the angel would have tried to describe to Daniel what weaponry or military capabilities of the future were, he would have been lost in the sauce more than he already was, right? So when we read chariots and cavalry, we have to remember this is going to take place in the future, like present day going into the future time frame. So what could cavalry be? What could chariots be? Chariots might just be tanks. Cavalry might be helicopters or any other form of like air mobile platform that delivers troops rapidly in space, right? But like if the angel would have said that there's going to be flying helicopters or that there's going to be big metal tanks with cannons in them, like he, Daniel wouldn't have understood that in 500 BC. So he had to use terms that he can digest. All right, next slide. So he will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. So here we now see, after this conflict, he's going to invade Jerusalem. All right, however, the land of Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from the wrath of the Antichrist. So who are the lands of Edom, Moab, and Ammon? What we know is they trace their lands and lineage back to Abraham. However, throughout the entire Old Testament, those people and the Jewish people were enemies. They were rivals, right? Um, we know the ge geographical area is what's known today as like Arabia, okay, and all the countries within that. But as to why the Antichrist won't crush them as well, we don't know. There's a bunch of different reasons. Maybe the s most simple answer is they don't offer any tactical advantage to the Antichrist. Maybe he just doesn't have a purpose for it. Or maybe God is softening the heart of the Antichrist to leave them alone to ultimately make the Jews themselves more jealous and more angry and more aware of their own transgression against God, more aware of their own punishment of God. Um, I don't know. Or maybe they just support the Antichrist. But either way, the, we see the Antichrist doesn't wage war against the enemies of Israel, but instead invades Israel. All right, that's the key takeaway from 41. All right, next slide. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and the riches of Egypt and the Libyans and the Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and north will alarm him, and he will set out a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. All right, so it just continues to describe what this conflict will look like. All right, and at the end, he's basically alarmed and realizes that he needs to return back to Jerusalem and basically fortify himself there. All right, and then that also reflects what we know from Revelation. We know that the Antichrist meets his end in Jerusalem. All right, we know that that's also going to be the location of the second coming of Christ, right? And then also, if we fast forward to today's time frame, why would the Antichrist, beyond biblical reasons, but like just more human domain reasons, why would the Antichrist want Jerusalem? If he's this military conquest guy, and he's all about his military power, what do we know about current state Jerusalem? That thing is impregnable, right? They're called, they have the Iron Dome defense. Like, it is the most defendable place, arguably, in the world because they're constantly under attack. And they know that the whole world hates them, right? They have the Iron Dome defense. So if the Antichrist makes a covenant and gets good with them and then goes against it, he now has access to this Iron Dome defense that he could fall back to. It makes sense, right? Beyond just biblical reasons of, like, that needs to happen because it's the holy city. All right, next slide. All right, so if we break all that down in the just more simple terms, it says, at the end of the times, the Antichrist will invade the Middle East and conquer Israel, breaking the covenant he confirmed with the nation from chapter 9, capture most of the city, including the temple. 
God will protect them from complete annihilation and some will escape. Nations will react and counterattack him, which will lead to the fall of Egypt and North Africa. This will lead to a resistance against him and many eastern nations, as well as nations from the north and the east, and they're all going to come to attack him. They're all going to come pushing towards Jerusalem, and he's going to fall back to Jerusalem when his end comes, as Jesus returns, destroys the, Anna, the Antichrist armies at Armageddon, and then the Jewish people, who by this time have already acknowledged who, who Jesus was and is, will be rescued, and the rock from Daniel 2 will destroy the Gentile rule over the Israel and crush rebellion against God, bringing in the millennial kingdom, right? So that's like exactly what we're talking about. If you piece together, you know, bits and pieces from other, um, other prophecy from Daniel, other places from like Zechariah or Revelation, you get a more holistic picture of what is happening and what this angel is describing to him. At the end of the day, all it's talking about is the military aspect of what the Antichrist is going to be doing, what's going to cause him to fall back to Jerusalem when Jesus will ultimately return and defeat him and install the Millennial Kingdom. That's what we're talking about. All right, next slide. So now we go into the book, uh, or chapter 12 of the book of Daniel. Okay, next slide. So once again, contextually from these verses, you realize that everything we just talked about does not apply to Antiochus Epiphanes. It doesn't apply to 170-ish, 160-ish BC. It applies to what's going to happen in the future. And you'll see it here in the text. Which means that the guy we were talking about was no longer Antiochus Epiphanes, but a future guy, which is the Antichrist. Okay? So at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, all right, so we're talking about Archangel Michael, will arise. There will be a time of distress that has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So now it says right there that at this time, so we're talking about the Antichrist, that all of a sudden now at the end of this, the culmination of it is the dead will rise, right? There's going to be a resurrection. And we know that that correlates with final judgment and everything else, but the dead didn't rise in 160-something B.C. after Antiochus Epiphanes was defeated by the Maccabean Revolution in history, right? Like that didn't happen. All right, so that means that everything we just read at the latter half of chapter 11 has to pertain to a future event, which is the Antichrist. Okay? Next, or, hold on. What else did I see here? Okay, so verse 2 is referring to the same thing that John references in chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. All right, so Daniel already saw the events that follow this. He already saw the judgment throne of God. He already saw all those things back in chapter 7. All right, the angel is just further illuminating and adding detail to it. All right, next slide. And then it says here, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the end, or until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. All right, so those who lead many to righteousness is talking about those who live for God and specifically those who live to follow the Great Commission, to win others for Jesus. All right, that's, who he's, that's what he's referring to. All right, Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. All right, and then verse 4, the angel instructs Daniel to record this prophecy and keep a, a copy of it, because he already knows that people in the future, once a lot of these events have already transpired, are going to realize the legitimacy and credibility of this prophecy. And they're going to use it to be prepared for the future. So the angel already knew it. The angel already told Daniel, like, yo, you need to save this 
because the people that are in the times leading to the end, they need this knowledge. And the angel already knew that those people would understand it better than Daniel does, which is why I told him to seal it up. All right, next slide. We're almost done here. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on the bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has finally been broken, all things will be complete. All right, so basically what Daniel is seeing here now is, if you remember at the beginning in chapter 10, the angel came to him. And this angel was in its angelic form, and he had eyes like fire and skin like topaz, and like he was so terrifying that Daniel was like ready to pass out, right? And then the prophecy happens. So now the prophecy's over. So Daniel snaps back to reality, all right? And he's looking up, and he sees other angelic beings. And these angelic beings are talking because they just overheard what the angel that was talking to Daniel said to him. All right? So one angel says to another angel, how long will it be before these things will be fulfilled? Because even they're appalled by what's about to happen to not only the Jewish people, which are God's people, but also the temple, also this Antichrist who's going to be speaking blasphemous words against God and all these things, right? So even they are like, well, how long is it going to be? Like, how long is God going to endure this? And the angel says, for a time, times, and a half a time. So what he's saying is, from the moment the Antichrist breaks the covenant until he meets his end, is going to be for three and a half years, which we know is the latter half of the tribulation period. We already talked about it. So during those three and a half years, that's the period where the Jews will be oppressed. That's the period where the Jews will be persecuted. That's the period where if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to die. That's the period where all the war and the bad things will happen. The first three and a half years are false hope. He lets them rebuild the temple. He lets them resume their sacrifices. He lets them proclaim that you know, they have sovereignty over Jerusalem again. He fools them. He tricks them. But then at the halfway point, he goes against that. So all the bad stuff is crammed into those three and a half years at the second half of the tribulation period. All right? Next slide. Oh, wait, hold on. And then it says, when the power of the holy people has finally been broken, all these things will be completed. What does that mean? What does that mean? When the will of the holy people has been broken, then it will be completed. What does that mean? What do you think that means, little Braden? Who are the holy people? The Jews. The Jews. So when the will, when their will has been broken, what do the Jews currently believe? The Jews believe that Jesus was not the Messiah. The Jews believe that the Messiah is going to come, right? And they're stubborn about it. So this is saying that the will of them will be broken, which means that they're going to have a revelation. They're all going to realize what they did. They're all going to realize that they messed up. They're all going to realize that the Messiah already did come, and they're all going to cry out for him. They're all going to cry out to God, reckoning with God, saying that they've separated themselves from him, saying that they admit that they killed the Messiah, and we're praying for his return. So when the people of Israel finally realize who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah and they accept the Messiah, just like we do when we first accept Jesus into our lives, what does God do? He sends the Holy Spirit. And this time he's going to send Jesus back again, all right, which then allows it to be completed. Does that make sense? Okay, next slide. Okay, this is, this is almost it. All right. And I heard, but I did not understand, so I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. 
None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So Daniel asked the angel, he's like, yo, so what is the outcome of all this? Like, what is going to happen? Like you said that we're going to go through all this trouble, all these wars, the Antichrist is going to come, all this will be bad, and then like God's going to come down. But what is going to be the result? What's going to happen? And the angel just says, go your way. I've already sealed up the roll. I'm done talking about it. Like, I gave you what I had. I told you to write it down. People will figure it out. The wise will figure it out. The people that study God's word will figure it out. People that put it together and are good biblical scholars, they'll, they'll figure it out. But like, you don't need to worry about it because it's not happening in your lifetime. So just write it down, seal it up, move on, Daniel. Don't worry about it. It's not pertaining to you. All right? And he, he alludes to it. He said, many will be purified, made spotless and refined. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. What he's saying is, is that there are two groups of people in the world. There are people that accept the truth and people that don't. There are people that once they do accept the truth, they dedicate themselves to learning more and more and more about the truth, growing closer to God. And then there are people that are like, that's good and all, but I still want the world. And they just pursue the world. In this analogy, the wise are those who realize who they are, realize their need for salvation, and dedicate their lives towards serving and learning about God. Okay? The wicked are those that say, nah, I'm just going to keep living my life. I'm going to keep pursuing the pleasures of my flesh, the pleasures of this world, and I don't care about the truth. All right? That's the wise and that's the wicked, the two camps of the world. All right? And what he's saying is those who are wise will get their nose in the book and they'll figure out the meanings of all this. All right, next slide. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation will be set up will be 100, or 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. All right, so here you have what's called the 75-day interval. And I have all the work done. If you want to read about it, I'm not going to cover it. But if you want to read about it, I can send you my slides. But basically, there's a 75-day interval. After Jesus Christ returns, the Antichrist is defeated. You have 75 days where all of the necessity, all the necessary things that God has made in his covenants with Abraham and with everyone else have to start taking place, all right, before the millennial kingdom begins, all right? It's a 75-day period. I have all the slides. I could teach it, but... I'll honestly just probably confuse 90% of you. So if you want to read it, you can read it. If not, it doesn't really pertain to this anyway. All right, but that's the numbers there. And I have it broken down. You have the 1260 days, which is the three and a half years, okay? And then it's adding on another 30 days and then another 45 days. And it's saying that blessed are those who reach the end of that 1,335 days because basically... A bunch of things are going to happen when Jesus returns, the Antichrist is defeated. People are going to get judged. They're going to get judged on how they, how they treated Israel during this, transgress, this transgress, transgression period, tribulation period, right? Because, once again, the church is removed on the forefront of that. So we're gone. Whether it happens in our lifetime or not, we're gone. The rapture happens, we are gone. So everyone that's left on the world after the rapture, they're damned. Like, they're, they're going to end up going to hell unless they redeem themselves by not taking the mark of the beast, by helping the, Israel, the Israelites during their time of transgression. However, those people will be the ones that make it to the end of the 1,335 days because they don't take the mark of the beast, they don't fail the, the judgment seat of, of God when he returns, Jesus when he returns, etc., Right, and once again, it's all part of the 75 day interval. Let, let, me, let me address that. Oh, that may confuse you. So, if the church is out here, right, we're raptured off the earth, then who is left to witness? Right? Well, the And they will be the ones that don't take on the mark of the beast, get martyred, 
um, or they flee and they continue to take care of the Jews who are also fleeing, et cetera. And yeah, anyway, that's a 75 day interval. If you're interested in it, just ask me, I'll email it to you. You can read up all about it. All right, next slide. And then uh, the angel says, as for you, go on your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of your days, you will receive your lot and its inheritance. And that's it. That's the end of the book of Daniel. So he gives them that prophecy at the end. Daniel's like, wait a minute, what's the result of this? What's going to come of this? The angel says, don't worry about it. Just write it down and drive on, Daniel, because at the end of your days, you'll get what's coming to you. You've been a good, faithful servant to God. You've done everything I asked. You don't need to worry about it, Daniel. Like, this ain't happening to you. Like, you're good with God. Just drive on until the end of your days. And that's the last prophecy that Daniel receives. So that concludes um, the book of Daniel. That's all I got. But, like I said, going forward, so next week we're going to begin the Sermon on the Mount. All right? And that... It's honestly probably going to be a very long class, duration-wise, a lot of weeks. Okay, so the next time I teach, we're doing Sermon on the Mount, so two weeks from now. Um, but it's going to be very discussion-based, and that's why it's probably going to take so long. Because, like, the way I have it built is at the very forefront of the class, there's, like, one block of instruction that I'm going to kind of teach just to make sure everyone's tracking what we believe as Christians. Like, what saves you, right? Because if we don't do that, then all of a sudden the Sermon on the Mount gets contorted and it becomes like a checklist of things that we need to do. And if we're doing that, we're not real Christians, right? Because there's nothing we can do to do enough good deeds to get in good favor with God, right? Like, we're saved by faith and faith alone. We're saved by God's grace alone. Okay, so we're going to talk about that up front first, just so that, like, we all are tracking. And then after that, when we move into it, we're literally just going to have, like, by-verse line discussions. So, like, the first opening gate verse is, like, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like, that will be on the screen, and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to be like, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What do you think that means? What do you think that means? And then, like, well, why are those people guaranteed heaven? The answer to that, just to give you a spoiler, is because, like, they realize their own sinfulness. To be poor in spirit means to be deprived, spiritually deprived, to realize that they are wicked, that they are evil, that they are separated from God. They're humble. And because they're humble, everything else will be pure in heart when they do it. But if you're not humble, then everything else you do is self-gratification. Right? If I don't realize I'm wicked, every good deed I do isn't actually probably good. It's probably because I'm doing it to make my own reputation go higher, or I'm doing it to bring me pleasure, or I'm doing it for other reasons than glorifying God. Right? But if I'm humble, then everything I do could then be a good deed. Right? And like, yeah, and we'll, we'll get into it, but it's going to be super discussion based, and honestly, it's probably going to take us until like late fall to just get through the whole sermon. But it'll be good. Everyone's going to learn a lot. Yes, yes, I, I, I will. I will. I'll, I'll convert it to a PDF. I'll send it out, and then this way everyone has it. Um, but it, it'll, it'll be good. But that's all I have. Thank you for putting up with me for Daniel. Um, I know it, it's, like, super difficult. It's just, in my own studies, I kept hearing scholars continue to refer back to Daniel, and I just didn't understand the importance of it. So I was like, I'm going to read Daniel. And when I read it, 